Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome today to talk about harvesting and post-harvesting handling um, and food safety. Um, we have with us, um, well, first off, myself, my name is Keto. Uh, I work for Keep Growing Detroit and I coordinate our education programming, amongst other things. And our teacher today is going to be one of our farmers, Mrs. Molly Hubble. Um, Molly's been with us uh, since, uh, for a long time. She's, she is the, and currently is she is uh, running all of our operations, at our marketing operations. We are selling at the Eastern Market on Saturdays. Uh, we have an online store and uh, we do also do some wholesale stuff. Uh, and she's got a lot of experience, experience with getting good looking produce out in the world. Um, so she's, and she's very, very versed in this topic. So I'm excited to have her talking with us tonight. Um, uh, a few quick housekeeping things. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, um, please direct your questions to the chat. Uh, the chat box is in the center. It should be in the center at the bottom of your screen. If there's time at the end, um, we'll open open it up for folks to unmute and ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, I will be kind of managing the the chat room and and um, look for breaks in Molly's uh, talking to uh, help out, you know, in facilitating asking folks' his questions. And with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Molly. Um, Molly, you want to test out your screen share? Or yeah, let's see. Okay, great. Hello. How's that? Great. <laughs> I feel like we've been doing this for like a year. I'm just getting the hang of it. <laughs> that was the easiest <laughs> screen share yet. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Uh, also, full disclosure, I am at the Keep Growing Detroit office right now, and there is an event. So you guys are probably going to hear some people walk past me at some point. Uh, some very fancy people wearing suits walking around. <laughs> um, but anyways, Keto, thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, today we're going to be talking about um, uh, harvest and post-harvest handling and some best practice for getting your produce to market. But I want to also say that um, even if you aren't currently marketing your produce or, you know, like have any plans to, if you're just a home gardener and you're growing for yourself, um, a lot of the things of pretty much everything that we're going to cover today um, is best practice for just growing produce for yourself and your families and your neighbors. Um, so even if you aren't a market gardener, um, and maybe some of you aren't, like this totally applies to you. Um, you know, even growing for myself, I always want to learn a little bit more how to, you know, store tomatoes better so that I can eat them. Uh, so this is for everybody. This is information for everybody at all levels of growing. Um, so um, healthy harvest, food safety, harvesting and storage for best practices. Um, Excuse me, Molly. Yeah. Oh. Can you put it into full screen, please? Is that full screen? Go into full screen. Can you put it in presentation mode? Oh, let me see. Uh, enter full screen. Go. Is that better? Yep. Uh, yep. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. And I can still see you guys. It's very good. Cool. So we've got kind of uh, three sections uh, to the presentation today. Um, in the first part, we're going to be talking about what is a uh, farm food safety plan. Um, and then the second section, we're gonna be talking about um, like kind of the process of harvesting. So like, what do you do before you start harvesting? What does harvesting look like? And then post-harvest handling, or like what happens after I've harvested it and wash it, washed it? How do I store produce? Um, and how do I get it to market looking its best? And then we're going to, in the third section, we're going to do kind of a deeper dive into like a crop by crop breakdown um, of uh, how each crop should be handled. So like tomatoes versus collards versus um, zucchini, 
Um, and that's a really great time for you guys to ask questions, but I'm sure there'll be tons along the way too. Um, so make sure you write them out in the chat um, so Keto can catch those and stop me if there's anything that's pressing that you guys need to know more about. Uh, so let's rock and roll. So um, what is farm food safety? Um, that's a great place to start, right? So when I say farm food safety or, you know, shortly FFS, um, we're talking about all the things you do in your garden and farm to keep uh, the produce uh, safe and well handled. And, um, you know, it's absolute best for uh, whoever ultimately eats it. So, um, yeah, it refers to what you do to make sure the food grown on your farm is safe to eat. Um, so it encompasses uh, what your harvest process looks like, um, the process for washing and packing, um, store, good storage, um, and also like good practice for worker health and hygiene. Like can people who have a cold or the sniffles like also be packing and uh, like harvesting produce today? Like that, the, that's information that would be included in um, your farm food safety plan. Um, and the main reason why we're talking about this at all is because recently there's been a lot, well, in the past five years, there's been a lot of movement around the um, Food Safety Modernization Act, FISMA, um, and the FISMA rule. Um, I believe it was 2009 where they came up with the rule in 2011, I believe, is when they started enforcing the rule. Um, but it basically says that um, farms that, I'm going to read this, uh, farms that have an average annual value of produce sold, covered produce sold during the previous three-year period of $25,000 or more and sell produce that is consumed raw, that's considered covered produce. There's a lot of like, you know, fancy language in the FISMA rule, um, are strongly encouraged to have a farm food safety plan. Are they required to have a plan? No, but for all the reasons on the next slide, it's always a good idea to have a plan. Um, doesn't matter if you're just growing for yourself or, or for sale to others, it's always a good idea to have a plan. Um, but that's actually the, the hard rule um, is that you will be strongly encouraged to have a farm plan or a farm food safety plan if you're at that level of sales or higher. I hope that's clear. It's still kind of, you know, most of the people in who sell through Grown in Detroit, which is one of our programs, and I think some of you do, um, or sell locally in Detroit, um, they're kind of at or below this level of sales. Um, so this is one of those areas where I get a lot of pushback from folks saying like, I'm too small, this doesn't, you know, <laughs> this, uh, this doesn't uh, apply to me and my growing um, because $25,000 or more, you know, in the past three years, like I only make a couple hundred bucks a season. Like, why would I even give this time of day, right? Well, you should, you should give it the time of day. You should really think about it. Um, uh, having a written guide, a farm food safety plan that you know, even if you're the only one in your backyard harvesting, um, it's just a good idea to get into a regular flow of how things are done um, in your backyard. Um, you know, and it can be as simple as like, I get my scissors out, you know, I wash them, I wash my hands, I get my favorite like harvest basket or like, you know, garden hod, and I go out there. Um, even if that's written on a post-it note, like that's technically a farm food safety plan, <laughs> which is wonderful. Um, and if you were to ever not be, a, you know, around to harvest and your neighbor comes over to do it in your stead, then you just have to point to the, you know, post-it note or like, you know, if it's like on a chalkboard, you know, outside somewhere, um, then that person knows what process, you know, to follow in order to do harvest safely, you know, when you're not around. Um, especially if you have youth or, you know, elders who are a part of your, you know, growing or your operation, um, health and safety is good for all folks. Um, so a farm food safety plan at a minimum should include include a description of your farmer garden. So, you know, if it's a raised bed or if it's 10 acres, um, just a description of where things are. Um, that would include things like, 
where potable water is, like your hydrants, like where's access to water, um, uh, where the shadiest places are, where do people, um, you know, if there's a restroom or some sort of facility on your property, marking that out. And then like, where are your grow beds? Obviously the biggest part of it. Um, and uh, where's parking, stuff like that. Things that would impact, you know, um, say food handling for sure. Um, where's your hand washing station, um, stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, that sounds like, you know, a lot. The Keep Growing Detroit's farm, the KGD farm, farm food safety plan is 60 pages long and it's full of procedures because we have so many people who interact with the farm. Uh, we had to standardize all of those things um, in a way that was easy to uh, communicate with all the different people, the people who come or used to come for classes, for volunteering, for, you know, picking up produce because they had, you know, purchased produce from us. Um, so we have this massive thing that's our farm food safety plan, but for home gardeners, really, I'm going to show you, uh, uh oh, there they are. <laughs> uh, so on the left <laughs> is one of 70 standard operating procedures, one seventieth of the Keep Growing Detroit's farm food safety plan. Um, an SOP or a standard operating procedure is a fancy word for saying, this is how we do it every time we do it. Uh, and it's written out so that you can share it with other people. So this is just a little taste of like, you know, what I'd call like, you know, a very advanced farm food safety plan uh, because that's the nature of, you know, KGD farm. It's a, it's a multi-use operation, right? And on the right, is something more akin to what I have at my house, which is a post-it note that is posted, uh, in this case, it's on the KGD office. I kind of staged this photo, but um, it's a post-it note on my back door that I read every time I go out there that says, please don't forget to do X, Y, and Z. You're about to go harvest. Uh, make sure that you're kind of following this procedure. And that's technically, the beginnings of a farm food safety plan. Um, and that's about as fancy as it needs to get um, uh, for most home gardeners, right? So it says, I gather my tools, I wash everything. Uh, you know, hand washing is right there in the middle. And at the end, I wash everything again and I stage it for the next time. So do you need one? The, the always question from folks. Um, yes, we encourage, Keeper in Detroit encourages all growers of different sizes uh, to not only practice safe food handling, but to also write down how you do that um, and stick to that flow um, uh, every time you go out. Um, so that, you know, um, if you do end up selling, um, there are, you know, certain times, depending on where you're selling, where they're going to actually require, um, they're going to require that you have a plan and that you share it and that they're able to review it. For example, if you were to sell to a grocery store or a sell to a co-op, they would absolutely want to see um, your good agricultural practices, paperwork, and something like a farm plan, um, in addition to all the like financial questions, right? Um, they would want to know how safely uh, you are processing your produce before they take you on as a contractor. Um, so definitely. Um, and uh, let's see, I think I've already said most of the things on this slide. Um, but yeah, once you get to a larger size, if that's like where you're headed, um, it's just going to make it that much easier for you to go for things like certification or those like big contract sales. Um, you may or may not be required. In fact, I think now, like with the farm foods, uh, with the FISMA um, Food Safety Modernization Act, they don't require that you have a farm plan, but it makes the process um, that much easier. Um, so it's a good idea. So that's kind of like, that's my spiel about farm food safety planning. 
Um, Keto, I don't know if we if any questions came from that or if we should keep rolling the, in kind of this middle section. There was a question about um, that you, uh, I think you're gonna get to, but the question is hand washing, should it be separate from produce washing station? Yes, 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 all day. <laughs> Absolutely, yep. And we are gonna get to that, but yes, that is for sure. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is on this slide. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna step into section two, which is let's talk about good, um, uh, harvest practice and kind of like the st three stages. So pre-harvest, harvest, and post-harvest handling. Um, so first section, and this is actually, so at the end, there's gonna be a slide with a whole bunch of resources for you guys to either print or download onto your computer. Um, and the next couple of slides are actually um, all taken from a, if you're in the garden resource program, you'll be very familiar with our one pagers. Uh, so we have a one pager that has all of this information just like crammed into one document. Um, and you'll also have the slides from uh, this presentation too. I believe Keto will email them to you. So you'll have like all this information in two places and you can print it out and you can put it on your refrigerator and it'll actually function like if you want to, your farm food safety plan. If this, if what I'm about to describe totally works for you, I've already done that. So you can just print it out, slap it next to your back door, and then you can follow that. And that's your farm food safety plan, which is pretty sweet. Uh, so we're going to get into our pre-harvest checklist. Um, these are all like recommendations for pre-harvest. Um, uh, this is not like the hard rule, but this is like a good suggestion of things to go through. But number one, um, if you're sit, sick, don't pick. <laughs> Pretty standard. Uh, if anyone is not feeling well um, or like is just getting over a cold, just in general, make sure that, you know, uh, they're not anywhere near food that um, is ultimately going to be sold or consumed by somebody else. Uh, that's how we spread colds around. Um, <clears throat> and even if you're not like make sure that you're wearing gloves, not gardening gloves, you know, that are like rough or made out of cloth, but make sure you have disposable gloves that you can wear while you're handling produce. Uh, also make sure that the water you're using for uh, washing, not only your hands, but also all produce is um, from a potable water source. Uh, so that's either like a sink or an outdoor faucet um, that's basically just city water. Do not use water from a rain barrel or another form of catchment for washing produce. Uh, that is a great breeding ground for bacteria and pathogens. Um, it's okay to use on your plants um, and you know the soils um, and in your like you know your um, or ornamental garden beds, um, but keep it away from washing produce that is uh, going you're gonna eat it tonight or someone's gonna buy it tomorrow. Um, I hope I make that clear enough. Um, and for hand washing, make sure that you have an area for washing, to get to this question, an area for washing your produce with its own water source. And over here somewhere, adjacent but separate, you have a second potable water source of, you know, um, a cooler, I'm gonna show you photos, or something where you can wash your hands, but you shouldn't be washing your hands in the same sink or your washing produce. Those should be two separate things, two separate processes. Uh, that'll help reduce contamination. And really with safe food handling, it's all about not eliminating because that's like never gonna happen, but uh, decreasing uh, pathogen that's bacteria and like human pathogens, human-borne pathogen um, exposure um, to the end consumer. That's like a fancy way of saying like, you know, keep the bacterial load to an absolute minimum uh, by keeping things well washed and sanitized and safe. Um, clean and sanitized tools. So cleaning is a two-step process. Make sure that you are not only scrubbing things down with soap, 
but that you also have what's called a kill step. So you are scrubbing with soap and water to get rid of the dirt. And then you're also applying something like a bleach, a mild bleach solution to that cleaned knife or bin or tabletop. Um, cleaning is a two-step process. Um, so you can use, yeah, um, we use like a, a watered down bleach solution uh, to do our kind of sanitizing step, but make sure that you're doing both before you use uh, the tools and equipment for, um, for harvesting produce. An animal check. Um, if you usually let your dog or chickens or cats outside to like hang out with you, uh, make sure that they're inside when you're harvesting. Um, and if you do see uh, feces or anything like that in and around the produce, uh, make sure you're avoiding that like the plague. Um, so if you do see that, you know, there's bird poop on your tomatoes, uh, don't do the thing where you just like put it in the bin with everything else that you've harvested and then you're like, oh, I'll wash it later, you know, I'll get to it. Um, just avoid that until you've harvested everything. Just avoid that area um, and maybe come back around later, um, but definitely don't bring something like that uh, to market. Um, even if you've washed it, it's just a good idea to kind of not. <laughs> and keep that out of uh, the population of stuff that you're gonna be bringing to market. Um, if you feel comfortable washing it off and eating it, go for it. But if it's going to a third party, uh, just avoid poop at all costs. <laughs> it's a good idea. Hand washing station. So here are two examples of pretty basic hand washing stations. Um, if you have a sink or like your kitchen is really close by, obviously use that. Um, but if you are maybe like you've got some lots and maybe you don't have a water hookup where you're like carrying your water with you, uh, both of these options are mobile. So the one person has like a, you know, like a Home Depot orange cooler um, that they've kind of tricked out with a roll of uh, paper towels and uh, even like bug spray. And uh, that's an excellent idea for a hand washing station. And then the other one is a water cooler on a little stand that I really like. And that green bucket on the bottom is all of your gray water. Um, and if you're using something like, you know, biodegradable soap in your hand washing station, uh, that gray water, you know, within reason can be, you know, instead of having to, you know, you can dump it in and around or on the outside of your garden beds. Um, and then it's like, you're not just like dumping chemicals around to something to think about. Um, but these are two fairly inexpensive and mobile hand washing stations. Um, so they don't have to be fancy. Um, make sure you're washing your hands, you know, before, during, and after harvesting, especially if you're like, sweating and touching your face a lot. Um, make sure you're washing your hands and make sure it's not coming, the water isn't coming from a water catchment. And for wash pack stations, um, I'm a huge fan of the top two. It's just a couple, even though two by fours are really expensive right now, um, that's a couple two by fours in one of those utility sinks that you can get at most like, you know, home goods stores, home appliance stores. Um, and the one on wheels, you can actually cart around and bring into the field with you. And they did this slick thing where they built it to fit their harvest bins um, that they use, which is pretty cool. So that one, they're all custom, but that one is pretty snazzy. We have something like that at KGD Farm. Um, and then on the bottom, you'll see uh, a totally you know, custom indoor wash pack with, you know, multiple bins, you know, lots of storage. Um, but if you look through that photo, you get some ideas there. Um, that rack that goes across, those are stock tanks, like for feet, for um, watering livestock, like cattle. But this thing right here, this rack, that's like one of those, you know, choose your own adventure, uh, 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 closet storage racks. And I thought that was a really sweet idea. Um, so that's pretty cool. Use what you got. But at a minimum, you want at least one sink or sink-like thing. That could be a Rubbermaid storage bin, and that's your like sink. 
Um, some sort of tabletop that's easy to clean. I encourage people to not use wood. Um, if you have, like this person used a red cutting board and fitted it into the top here. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, wood tends to collect uh, bacteria. And if it gets wet uh, and isn't sealed in some way, um, that's food safe. Uh, it's just a breeding ground for bacteria. So wood's like, eh, you know, if you need to. Um, but ideally, it's like some sort of like plastic, you know, easy to clean tabletop. And then wire, um, what's it called? Hardware cloth um, is a nice addition for spraying off root vegetables and drying stuff. Um, so I'd say a sink, some sort of cleanable surface, and then some sort of like drying rack um, is a good idea. Harvest tools and equipment. Um, this is more just for reference. I feel like you guys all know kind of like what's involved with harvesting, but um, just as a reminder, these are some of the basic tools people need. Um, and of course, depending on your operation, you may or may not have produce scales. If you don't have to, you know, weigh stuff out because it's going to market, maybe you don't have scales. Um, uh, and if you're doing all of your post-harvest handling in your kitchen, you probably don't need a shade tent. <laughs> that would make sense. Um, but it's always a good idea to have a really sharp knife. The sharper, the better. Uh, and you'll see why in a second. Um, and yeah, it's a good idea to, you know, have rubber bands or something to put produce in. A uh, quick note is that um, with pack materials like rubber bands or plastic uh, bags. Um, those should all be considered single use only. So I know some people like myself tend to like take the rubber band off of the asparagus they just bought at market and then put it in a junk drawer and then reuse it. Um, that's cool for you, but if you want to sell produce, don't use rubber bands or bags that, you know, you got from the grocery store or you've been like, you know, have been kicking around your drunk drawer, junk drawer, <laughs> not drunk drawer. Um, uh, use fresh packing materials every time you harvest. And then the harvest process itself. Once again, we are looking for what we call animal contamination. That's a very nice way of saying poop, but animal contamination, um, avoid it if you're, you know, gathering produce for market um, and for sale. Um, if you're, you know, gathering produce for yourself, that is totally up to you. Um, one cut, so this is where sharp, sharp knives come uh, in handy. Um, always try to minimize the number of cuts you're making. So if you are cutting, for example, cabbage or head lettuce or something where you have to do a chop, uh, instead of hacking at it, you know, multiple times, always aim to have one very clean, perfect cut. If your scissors are dull, um, uh, that tends to multiply the number of cuts you're making. And of course, anytime you're cutting into or, um, uh, produce, leafy greens, cabbages, and the like, yeah, that's an opportunity for bacteria to get into your produce. So you want to minimize cutting and chopping. Uh, that's really, really important if you're doing like salad mixes um, or baby greens. Uh, you want a really sharp knife for that. Uh, and this goes without saying, be picky. So I call this the if you wouldn't pay full price for it at a grocery store, uh, don't expect customers at a farmer's market to do the same. And I think all of us kind of know what is marketable and what isn't because we all buy produce at a grocery store and we're all probably fairly picky about what that stuff looked like. You know, you want to check for ripeness. You want to like make sure it doesn't smell off. And then you want to like not have it full of like bug holes and, you know, caterpillars all up in it. So be picky, um, only harvest the best and what's ripest and what has the least amount of damage. Um, and that's if it's going to your neighbor or your, you know, your friends, uh, your colleagues or for market. 
Um, and then the rest of it, the stuff that's maybe like a little funkier, um, that's for you <laughs> and is uh, up to your better judgment how to use it. Um, and on the KGD farm, we call those kind of like, they're not gonna, you know, they're not the best, they're kind of on the edge. Uh, maybe they've got a lot of holes or they've got some chew marks in them. Um, those are what we call seconds. Um, and sometimes they, you know, they go home with staff or um, they just don't go to market. Uh, and of course, always another round of hand washing. You can never wash your hands too much. It's impossible. And then the third step, post-harvest. So once you have all of this stuff, what do you do with it? Uh, well, number one, keep it cool. Keep all of it cool. Um, so that's, you know, if you're doing a lot of harvesting and you don't do this in your kitchen, it's always a good idea to find a shady spot. Um, ideally, a shady spot that doesn't have a lot of birds hanging around above your head. Um, but maybe if you've got a backyard umbrella or you have one of those market tents, um, just somewhere where you can take the heat, um, you know, lessen the impact of heat and direct sunlight. Um, and in general, you're aiming for, you know, a cooler storage situation of roughly 40 degrees. And we're going to talk more about cooler storage, but have that in your mind. A lot of leafy greens and vegetables like very cold temperatures. Um, next is as you're washing stuff, um, if you notice that the water is getting murky, you know, a little like you can't see through it anymore, or you have a bunch of, um, you know, like maybe some bugs came out, like while you're washing stuff, uh, swap it out. So change your wash water regularly. Uh, don't use the same wash water all day. And that has the added benefit of keeping your wash water cool. Um, it's always a good idea, especially with leafy greens and things that wilt quickly, to get them into water as quickly as possible. So cold water is going to help you um, keep those uh, leafy greens fresh. Uh, so keep keep refreshing your water to keep it cool and to keep it clean. Use clean packaging we already talked about. Um, and also once you're completely done with harvesting, you want to go through and clean and sanitize all your stuff again. Um, so I am definitely the person who like uses my harvest knife a million times and then doesn't clean it after harvesting. And then that just kind of like adds to the amount of work you have to do before you even start. Um, so it's just good habit to, you know, at the end of the day or after harvesting, go through and wash and sanitize and just set yourself up for the next time. Um, it'll go a little faster. And then clean transportation. This is for market gardeners for sure. Um, if you are bringing your produce to market, like GID tabled on Saturdays at Eastern Market, um, make sure that your car is cleaned out. Um, and that uh, you're not throwing it into the back of a pickup truck where it's just gonna be exposed to sunlight and it's just gonna heat up. Um, so make sure you have covered bins and they're kept you know, in like an air conditioned car. You wanna just, once it's cold, you wanna just maintain coldness until it goes to the consumer, your neighbor, uh, a customer at market, a grocery store. Um, you just want to keep it in that state for um, as long as possible. Um, because again, yeah, as I said on the bottom, pathogens love to be warm and they will multiply when you give them a lot of like warmth and humidity. Um, so those are the things that you really want to avoid. Cool. Tips for longest storage life on your produce. And this is, you know, this applies to pretty much everything. Um, you want to harvest fruits and vegetables at peak maturity or as near as possible. Um, so get them not too, too early and not too, too late, but like at the right time. And this is something that you just kind of, this is a skill for like watching things that you just kind of grow as you get more and more experience. Um, but if you harvest something and it's too far gone or it's past peak, 
even good storage, you know, process is not going to save it. Um, and we're ultimately aiming to give, um, if you're selling your produce, we want the customer to be able to have it for as long as possible. Um, so you want it to have a long shelf life. And if it's too far gone, that it means they're only gonna, they're gonna have to use it immediately or they're gonna lose it. Um, now let's say use produce and uh, only harvest produce that's free from all visible evidence of disease. I think we all know what blossom end rot looks like on a tomato. Um, and I have a picture of it coming up in a minute if you don't. Um, but yeah, again, if you wouldn't buy it full price at a grocery store, it's the same rule. Just, you know, maybe don't bring it to market because customers have the exact same eyes you do. So um, that goes same for insect damage. Make sure that your collards and kale aren't covered in aphids um, when they come to market, right? That's kind of an everybody problem. Um, and handle food carefully. This is something I see all the time where, you know, bins, you know, get kind of like tossed on the tables and then all your tomatoes get squished um, or, you know, greens get kind of like thrown and then all the leaves crack. Um, handle them gently and get them into a shady cool spot as quickly as possible um, is just good practice. Um, leave an inch or more of stem on most vegetables to reduce water loss and prevent infection. Definitely. Um, the stems on collards and kale, especially, act as almost like pathogen blocks. Um, they will prevent, you know, it's, it's a very small amount of surface area on the end of a stem, as opposed to a surface area all along a cut leaf. Um, so just like, you know, if you were to get a really big cut on your arm that's like open, like you would want to have that covered as much as possible because that's just, a, a you know, asking for some sort of infection, right? But if you only got like a small pinprick, you know, like a Band-Aid is going to do it and you're probably going to be fine. So the bigger the wound on the produce, the more likely it is to attract and uh, attract bacteria and pathogens. So uh, you want to minimize that as much as possible. Cool. Storing produce. Um, so I've got pictures here of what's called a cool bot. It's a computer you can buy or a little uh, computer and program you can buy um, that hooks up. You can see this bottom photo um, to a traditional uh, air conditioning unit, like a window unit. And it actually forces the air conditioning unit to overcool a space. It's pretty neat. So you can turn an air conditioner into a cooler storage environment, like 40 degrees, um, uh, with the use of this tool. And they're available online. We have one at the uh, KGD farm. I have one at my house for my own walk-in cooler. Um, it's kind of a neat thing, um, and it's really cost, I'll say cost effective and makes cool, super cool, but like medium large storage available to small scale growers. It's a pretty cool invention. Um, storing produce, generally um, you want to harvest as close to market day as possible, so either you know, very early in the morning that day or, you know, the day before. But a lot of that depends on your ability to, to hold and store that produce appropriately. Um, if you don't have good cold storage, um, you want to kind of tighten up on the uh, amount of time between like harvesting, getting it to market. Um, in general, the better your cold storage and the more reliable your cold, cold storage, the farther out you can harvest from, you know, harvest to making it to market or whomever is, you know, picking up your produce. Um, but if you don't have great storage or storage capacity, then you want to tighten that up and harvest, you know, right before market. Um, and I already said, yeah, the aim is to give the, uh, the consumer um, product that will last at least a week. That's just like a really good goal. Um, and now we're going to talk about storage life. So this is the big question. 
what temperature should I store it at? And what follows is a document and information uh, by crop on how you should um, best practice for storing those crops. Uh, but in general, there are a couple like uh, a couple different environments or general environments that um, certain crops want. Um, so, and they they look like this. So, cold and humid, cool and humid, cool and dry, and then warm and dry. And the vast majority of the things that you'll be harvesting want one of those four environments. Um, and like, for example, like cold and humid, that's like your humidity drawer in your refrigerator. Um, cool and moist, that one's kind of like, that one's tricky. Um, that's almost like a, that's the special environment. Um, warm and dry, that's kind of, you know, we're getting into like root cellar territory, but let's, let's take a look at this. Actually, before we do quiz time, Keto, how should we do this quiz? Uh, popcorn style. Yeah, so I like it. On you. Yeah. Sweet. So um, just to test your knowledge, I've got, um, so we've just kind of explained the four different uh, uh, storage environments. So the quiz is, can you guess which, which environment matches the vegetables on that list below? So your options for environments are in blue and so let's let's give it a shot. So can anybody guess uh, what the appropriate environment is for sweet potatoes? Is it cold moist, cool moist, cool dry, or warm dry? So if you could unmute yourself, uh, please say your name first. Anybody who's willing to jump in? There's an answer in the chat from someone. Oh man. Um, would it be warm and dry? For sweet potatoes? Yeah. Molly? It is. <laughs> I'm getting, we're getting there. Yeah, we can double check in a second, but <laughs> yes. Um, or it's, that's right. Um, and then collard greens? Would that be cool dry? That's actually going to be super cold and humid. So number one, number one choice. So leafy greens in general want super cold temperatures. Actually, I feel like most people are surprised uh, when they see 32 to 36 degrees for collards. But if you want to hold collards for over a week, you want super cold and then you want fairly humid too. Anyone want to try with tomatoes? Maybe somebody else this time? Warm and dry? Close. Next one up. <laughs> they want, uh, well, actually, you know what? It's kind of in the middle here, but um, ideally tomatoes want 55, roughly 55, I guess it is warm and dry. You're right, it is uh, 55 degrees roughly and slightly more humid. Uh, fun fact, if you, if you cool, especially heirloom tomatoes too much, uh, they start to um, become mealy on the inside and they lose a lot of their sweetness. Um, so cold temperatures, anything below 55 will actually uh, start to destroy all the things that we love about heirloom tomatoes. So well done. And let's see, should we go through the list or should we? No, take the one? Yeah, okay, cool. Eggplant. Oops, my, my screen just froze. Not every play at once now. Cool and moist. 
It is cool and moist, not super cold. So 40 to 50 usually. Yeah. And then, and then higher humidity. And how about beets? Root vegetables in general, this applies to carrots. I'm willing to pay whoever's class fee today if they have that because my beets never, I can't, I don't take good care of my beets. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I get that. I was not very good at beets at some point. It was either the root looks great or the greens looked great, but never at the same time. <laughs> um, well, I'll do, I'll do beets. It's cold and moist. Uh, that's their favorite. And here we go. So the next three slides are lots of information, but basically you'll see up at the top, um, there are beets. This is, um, this is cold and moist environment. Um, and you'll see the vegetables listed on the left, their ideal temperature and their ideal relative humidity. Um, relative humidity is a hard thing to manipulate even in your uh, refrigerator. Um, you can kind of manipulate it by putting uh, like a like damp paper towels in the bag. And this is more for like if you're harvesting stuff for yourself, but you can kind of like mimic a he high humid environment if you like put your leafy greens in the coldest drawer in your refrigerator and then put a slightly damp paper towel in with it. That'll kind of like mimic, mimic this ideal environment. Um, uh, that's, that's what I've come up with to do. But um, so this, this document shows you exactly what to do. And then on the side, it shows you if you were to recreate this environment, temperature and humidity quickly and got it cold very quickly and it was, you know, cut well and it was at the right, you know, stage of um, ripeness, you know, I was surprised to learn that I could hold beets for months <laughs> at 32 degrees with a 95% uh, humidity. That's pretty amazing. Cool, moist. Um, so actually I should say, so in general, your super cold, but really high humidity environment is gonna be best for root vegetables, um, leafy greens, um, cabbage, asparagus, peas, believe it or not, sweet corn, you know, uh, is this is its favorite environment, salad mixes, this is what they all want. This is how you maximize their shelf life. Uh, cool and moist, so not like crazy cold, but 45 to 50 degrees. This is where you see peppers, potatoes, and tomatoes. And actually really with the tomatoes, you'll see on the bottom there, um, ideally not like from my, you know, experiences growing these guys and trying to hold them for a long period of time, anything below 55 degrees for a tomato, you're gonna start to see quality decline. So really like 55 degrees to like 60 degrees, um, but they also want a humid environment. So that's kind of a tricky one to recreate. Uh, same goes for peppers, watermelon, cucumbers, and snap beans. Cool and dry. Um, these are things that usually get some sort of uh, curing phase. So they get harvested, and then they get a period of drying before they're what's called shelf stable. So this is like garlic, which has to dry, um, like your garlic bulbs need to dry before you do that final cut and then they store well for a long period of time. Uh, same goes for winter squash and sweet potatoes. These are all things that you pull out of the field, you put in a warm but like shady environment with good airflow, and then you let them dry for a period of time um, and then you're not going to store them at, you know, super cold temps um, or super humid temps, it's kind of somewhere in between, um, like root cellars or where you tend to see these environments. Um, um, and I'll say, yeah, the exception, um, garlic and onions do still want to be stored 
really, really cold, but also not terribly high humidity. So like some, you know, some variation there. Molly, you got a question? Yeah, what's up? My carrots sprout roots in the refrigerator drawer. How do I prevent that? Gotcha. Um, it's probably a temperature thing. Um, I would say, so like they're getting like little hairs coming off of them, like little, little roots. Um, that's probably, so if we go back to carrots, um, I'll bet, are they on here? There we yeah. go. Yeah, um, I'll bet, so my refrigerator holds around like 40 degrees. Um, storage carrots uh, really want even colder temperatures than that. Um, I'll bet they're getting that high humidity and they're also getting a little bit warm or warmer than, you know, if you're holding them for a long time in the refrigerator, they're gonna start wanting to grow roots and maybe shoots if they're still attached. Um, but I'll bet it's because it's slightly warmer in your fridge. Um, so either find a colder, like, you know, either a colder drawer in your refrigerator um, for storing them, or you could possibly knock down the humidity, but that's also tricky. But I'll bet it has to do with them being a little bit warmer um, than they should be. That's a good question. Cool. Any other questions about that? We're gonna we're gonna step into like the third section, which is more talking um, about harvest practice, but by crop. So this is a good time where you know if we're talking about watermelon, we're gonna talk about greens and cabbage and tomatoes. Now, like a deep dive into those crops individually. So um, this is a great time to ask questions or you know plug them in as we're going. But um, We've got like, I don't know, I think it's like at least a dozen different crops we're gonna talk about now, which is pretty cool. Um, so bring on all the questions, but we're gonna start with greens. Uh, kale, kale, collards, chard, mustards, and they're kind of lumped together because they, they get harvested in a very similar fashion. Um, so a note about how the plant grows, um, they grow new leaves from the top the apical meristem, that like nub on the top. And then they're always growing upward on the stalk and they have newest leaves on the top, oldest leaves on the bottom. And in general, you wanna harvest the bottom leaves first and let that top continue to regenerate. You'll end up at the end of the season with something that looks a bit like a um, but that's a way to maximize the length of your harvest window. If you were to just start taking all of the uh, leaves from the top of the plant, it would ultimately like stop producing. So if you're just going out there and picking from the bottom and moving up and picking from the bottom and the bottom, you're going to be able to harvest over many months instead of just like a couple of weeks. So harvest from the oldest leaves first. Um, and you don't want to over harvest. Um, so you want to leave enough, like 50% of the leaves on that plant so that it can continue to like, you know, feed itself and keep itself happy and regenerate. Um, and uh, this is true, soaking leaves in a tub of water helps remove any lingering insects. Um, that's true, the longer you leave, so we do a soak on the farm of like 20 minutes in really cold water. And that's usually enough to knock the majority of aphids off um, it loosens them and also like kind of suffocates them. So they, they fall off a little bit easier. Um, and again, if you're harvesting the oldest leaves first, you know, it means you're prolonging your harvest window, your harvest season off that plant. Um, and don't forget, shameless plug, that you got uh, kale and collard transplants from us for cold crop distribution. But in July, you will get a second round of kale and collard transplants from us um, to refresh um, the plants that you got from us in the spring. Um, and those plants that you plant in July will carry you well through October. 
Last year, it was even into November that we were harvesting off of our July plants. So that's a big window um, if you get round two from us. Um, and the previous document told you how to store them. They want, again, 32, 32 to 36 degrees, no higher than 36 degrees, really, as cold as you can get without freezing. Um, and they want high humidity. That's their ideal. And if you're able to accomplish that, you can keep your collards and your kale and your refrigerator for up to one to two weeks without them declining in quality. Talking about quality. So here are a couple pictures. So like that's a really nice looking collard plant right here. Um, this is a really nice bunch of collards that is ready for market. Um, and you can see like on this like collard plant, the middle, the apical meristem, like that's where the new growth is. And you can see that it's like that apple green color. When you're harvesting, you want to avoid those. That's going to be harvest two weeks from now. And then you want to harvest what's all around the edge. Those are the oldest leaves. You want to get, basically take those off first. And then we also have a photo of some gnarly damage. This is uh, uh, that white butterfly, that cabbage, cabbage white caterpillar damage. Um, this is not marketable, but you're more than welcome to eat it for yourself. <laughs> so I would consider those seconds for a market. Kale, kind of same deal. Like we've got a good bundle of aphids on this leaf. You want to avoid those. If you have aphid issues in your field um, and you're just like us, more con concerned about sprays and pesticides, uh, you can go out there and you'll, if you only have a couple of or kale plants, you can go out there with um, uh, the jet setting on your, like, you know, your hose nozzle and you can spray them off um, to keep the population to a minimum. Largely, if aphids get knocked off the plant, they have a really hard time crawling back up. So that's a very gentle way of trying to control aphids or at least like keep their numbers down. Um, but this is definitely not marketable um, with that many aphids on there. That is definitely not for Eastern market. Um, and then we have just beautiful examples of curly kale Red Russian or Ragged Jack Kale and Lacinato or Dino Kale in the corner. Okay, cabbage, best practice. Uh, harvest the entire head um, at a time. Cabbage breaks my heart because it's a one-off harvest. It takes, you know, two months to you wait for that harvest. Um, and another reason why it breaks my heart is that cabbage is one of these things at market or in the grocery store that only fetches like a couple of dollars. Um, so once you've grown your own cabbage, I feel like you have a real appreciation for just how much work it is to get to having one perfect cabbage. And it's a big plant. So it takes up a lot of space and you only get one harvest off of it. Um, but one way to maybe extend the harvest a little bit with your cabbage is when you're harvesting it, don't cut it all the stalk all the way down to the, the soil, leave a couple of inches there, um, and maybe leave some of those like leaves, you know, those, the big fan leaves that are like kind of on the bottom, leave those there and just take kind of like, you know, the ball off and sell that or use that because sometimes you can the the cabbage will kind of regenerate and you'll get these little cabbage heads that grow like a second growth off the stock and then those are delicious and then you can eat those and maybe get like a second mini harvest off of it you can also eat you know eat the cabbage leaves just like you would collards um so there are a couple ways to kind of like get multiple products off of one cabbage plant um, and, uh, it's a storage crop. You can set, uh, store it for several months, but refer to the sheet before or the slides before on best storage. Those guys want super cool temps and, um, uh, high humidity for good storage. Broccoli head, same deal. So just like cabbage, it's kind, kind of one-off harvesting. 
uh, you want to make sure you have a really sharp knife and you're doing only just a single cut of that, like, you know, that cluster on the top of the broccoli plant. Um, you can also eat the leaves just like you would uh, collards or kale. So that's like a second product off of your broccoli. And oftentimes the broccoli will then send out much smaller, but way more little mini heads after you cut the top off. So just like cabbage, sometimes you get a mini version of that crop um, after you harvest like the big showpiece off the top of it. Um, and they will, they'll store for again, one to two weeks, not as long as cabbage, but one to two weeks if they're getting super cold temps and high humidity. And here's some lovely pictures of cabbages. Um, so again, uh, if you were, I guess this is a pretty good picture. If you were to cut, I don't know if you can see on this first kind of drawing picture, cut a little bit higher on the plant, that sometimes will, you know, give you those like little mini cabbages, um, a second go around with the cabbage. Um, and then this one down in the lower right, that's a cabbage that is super far gone uh, in terms of insect damage. That would definitely not be marketable at like Eastern market. Um, but you can absolutely use it yourself and make a good slaw out of it. Brussels sprouts and leeks. Brussels sprouts um, are wacky. Um, I get a lot of questions about Brussels sprouts. Um, so they appear at the base, so they grow up like a kale or a collard, but with a really long stalk. Um, and the sprouts actually appear at the base of each one of the leaves. Um, and they take a really long time to develop those sprouts. Um, so if you planted them in the spring, you probably won't harvest a stalk of Brussels sprouts until September. Um, it just takes a long time to get there and a really good, a lot of work goes into managing them, right? But they're worth it because they're delicious. Um, um, uh, as the sprouts are forming, you may see that the leaves that they're like forming at the base of, those leaves will yellow and start to fall off. That's totally fine. Uh, you can actually just like, you know, gently pop those leaves off and remove them to compost. Um, as the plant grows up, it will continue to create more of those, um, those sprouts up the stalk. Um, and the leaves falling off is totally just a part of the process. Um, once you get to the point where, you know, it's like September, October, you're starting to get, you've got a lot of leaves, um, you've got a lot of little sprouts starting, um, but maybe the ones that are oldest look big and then the ones at the top look really small. One trick you can do to make those top ones fill out and get as big as the one, the sprouts on the bottom is to top the plant. So like a couple of weeks before you anticipate the plant being done, you actually, with a sharp knife, you cut the top off and like the leaves, the young leaves off. And then the plant will put all that energy laterally into growing bigger Brussels sprouts. Um, so that's a trick. It's all about really good timing. Um, so that's my Brussels sprouts spiel. Um, with leeks, um, you want to plant them deep and then you want to hill them periodically, which means pile soil up around the, um, the stem of the plant. Um, and bury it underground. Um, not completely, you want to like bury, you know, like a third of the plant each time so it has enough of the leaf up to sustain itself. Um, but uh, if you hill plants one to three times um, over the course of the summer, um, again, those are like a longer season kind of plant to grow. Um, so if you hill them a couple times, not only will the stem elongate, um, and you'll get this nice long leak out of it instead of these like little like shorty guys, you'll get a nice long leak and it will get blanched. So it will be deprived of sunlight and you'll get that nice white leak that you see in the grocery store um, by covering it with soil periodically. Um, 
and leeks are a storage crop. Um, they can be held at or near freezing or in a root cellar for a few months. Totally accurate. So 32, 34 degrees, um, and you'll get them to last for quite a while. Hey, Molly. Yeah. Why don't we pause for a second and um, just check in and see if anybody's got any questions. What's going on? Sounds good. How's everybody doing? Does anybody have any questions so far? Thumbs up. Keep going. Rag and roll. Rag and roll. Uh, wait, hold on. Uh, uh, Andrea, Andrea said, nope, keep going. Okay, <laughs> very good. Right on. So uh, pictures of leaks. So you can kind of see from the bottom photos that the soil has been, or you can see like where this person is pulling them out of the ground that a good six inches of that plant was actually buried. So that gives you an idea of like how far down they got buried um, and hilled in soil. Um, and then at the upper left, you can see what they look like when they've been cleaned up for market. Um, so we cut the roots off of them. Uh, that's more like, you know, based off of like what customers want their leaks to look like. You don't have to cut the roots off of them, but we do just because that's what people expect. Um, and then you want to give the leaves a trim. However, the leaves you can also use in cooking. So we give them kind of a little bit of a trim just to make them fit in our harvest bins, but, um, and to make them look kind of pretty all like fanned out. Um, but that's kind of like the min, you know, minimal, you know, cleanup on leaks. Um, if they're really funky or the, um, the outermost leaf is really dirty, um, sometimes I'll, or it's going yellow sometimes, I will peel that off um, when harvesting and leave it in the field to compost, but I'll peel off the very, like the, um, the outermost leaf, which will expose like a really beautiful, like, you know, that, that white kind of cream colored leak. Um, and then it just like, is kind of like an instant, you know, like uh, market ready look for leaks. Um, that's a really quick way to make them look marketable. Um, cool. I stuck onions in here too. They're very similar. They're in the same family. Um, bulb onions are long season, or we have a short season, but they're considered like long onions. Uh, the ones that we gave you, um, we'll finish probably late July, maybe first week in August, somewhere around there. Um, the way to know when your onions are done is you can see this photo, the green tops fall right over. And that's how you know that the onion is done growing for the season. Um, any earlier than that, and you're just losing out on like the size, as long as the greens are upright, they're still growing out like this. But once the tops fall over, they're done. Um, so when the tops fall over, pull them out. Um, these guys get a cure. So you want, uh, you know, a, at least a week uh, in a very shady, well-ventilated, like warm location um, so that those greens can, you know, crisp up and dry completely. Um, and the outermost, uh, you know, like, I guess, paper wrapper on the onion can dry. Um, and if you give them a cure like that, they will store for a very, very long time. Um, so that's my spiel on onions. I'm just gonna keep plowing through on, unless people have questions and keto stop me if you'd see something. Um, bok choy, um, I agree with this. Most varieties around 50 days from seeding to marketable and mature. Um, Bok choy really hates the heat and it will go from perfect to bolted, like from like a perfect nice head of bok choy to having that flower stalk up the middle of it overnight or within a matter of hours. So you'll go out one day and it'll be perfect and the next day it'll be bolted. Uh, bolting almost always makes things more bitter and changes the flavor of the crop. Um, 
So you want to make sure sometimes it changes the texture too. things will start to get what we call like woody once they go into that kind of reproductive phase um, and they're just like less delicious. Um, so you got to make sure that you're watching the bok choy when you're growing it. It's a quick crop from perfect to bolted. Um, and let's see, uh, you can harvest either the individual leaves off of it, just like you would kale or collards. You just pluck the oldest leaves off of it, or you can harvest the whole head just like you would a cabbage. Uh, bok choy doesn't regenerate though. So if you're gonna harvest the whole head, that's it, bok choy gone. These guys like very cold temperatures and high humidity as well. And then celery, because I think we gave out celery this spring. So if you got celery, this is another one where I get a lot of questions about celery growing um, because most uh, put it in the garden and then they expect it to be just like the celery they get in a grocery store. But there's an extra step for making your celery that we gave you from the garden resource program offerings look like and taste like the stuff you get in the grocery store. Um, and that's called blanching. So in order to get something that tastes and looks like grocery store celery, you have to blanch it, um, which means uh, basically shielding it from the sun for a period of time before you harvest it. And that period of time varies, but it's usually somewhere around two weeks of blanching to get something that looks like celery, celery, celery that we use. Um, um, you can do this by either, so you can blanch celery by either um, covering the plants, and I'm gonna show you some examples, or by hilling them with soil, just like you would those leeks. So that's like mounding soil up around the, um, the stalks as they grow, um, or planting them really, really close together. So tight spacing, so that they're actually blocking each other's access to the sun and growing up straight and long. Um, after you harvest, you can either harvest the stalks individually off or you can harvest the whole head. Uh, make sure they go into cold water immediately. That's called hydro cooling um, after harvest um, because they do wilt and they kind of, you know, their, their flavor and their texture kind of declines. Um, uh, harvested celery that hasn't been blanched and um, yeah, it, it's got a completely different flavor if you don't blanch it. And that's that's where I get the questions from. One, it'll look dark green. Two, it will be really, really tough and stringy. Um, and three, it will have really, really concentrated celery flavor, like really intense, which is delicious in its own right. But um, let me show you some examples of blanching. Oop, that's bok choy. That's a marketable bunch of bok choy. We bundle them together like that. And then this is celery. So up here we have celery in its naturalness. So this is celery that has not been blanched. It's got like full color all the way through the stock. And then in the middle, we have two, two approaches to blanching celery. So these guys used I think they're cereal boxes uh, and they just like collared the plant um, kind of loosely even, but they kept those collards, collars, cereal box collars on them for a couple weeks. And in doing that, the celery becomes lighter. Um, it stretches. Um, it it uh, has more water content in it, so that flavor starts to be less concentrated and that stringiness starts to lessen. So you actually, it becomes more tender. Um, so if you want tender, like sweet flavored, um, very like crunchy celery that isn't like stringy, uh, you're gonna have to blanch it. Um, and then this person down here used just like rolled up cardboard that was like strung together with twine. And then these two pictures are what they look like at harvest. So super tall, super elongated with that really light stem. That is how you make celery happen. Any questions about that? Uh, let's see, I'm just double checking here. Um, 
One person said mine bolted when it was tiny. Uh, then another person said, I love the seller without blanching. Correct. It's very concentrated. Great for souk stock. Yep. Big time. And then third one is said, so, uh, and then the third one is at which, what point should celery be blanched? Gotcha. So when, when do you start blanching? You start blanching. So I think celery is, I, I need to find like the days to maturity, but it's, uh, right. One is if it's bolting when it's small, uh, it was probably, well, that tells me it got too hot. Our spring was really weird. We had like 90 degree temperatures really, really early. I feel like, at least in my growing, some of my cold crops got a little freaked out by it and a lot of them bolted early. So some of that might just be the season Celery likes cool temperatures in order to establish. Um, and when we get warmer springs, like even like bok choy and other things were kind of affected by it too. Um, so that could have been the reason for it. Um, you, can, you can shade it, you can keep it in a shadier place in your garden for maybe next year. Um, just in case it gets too warm too early. Um, but then with blanching, you want to make sure that um, the plant is kind of just big enough to handle it, in my opinion. So like somewhere around, you know, a foot tall, 10 to 12 inches tall. And like you can gather those leaves up if it's too small. Um, not great, but it's got to be big enough to handle it. And you also have to like collar it up in such a way that the leaves still have access to light. So like if the plant is only this big, you know, that's a really tiny collar. So it's got to be, you know, I'd say at least 10, 12 inches tall um, in order to actually, you know, be able to get anything around it. Um, so that's my recommendation. Um, uh, it's there, it looks like they're at Roughly 85 to 100 days, most most varieties. Yeah, it's a really long, it's, it takes a while. <laughs> Thanks for looking that up. Uh, yeah, start them early, finish them mid, okay. midsummer, but they, they have to be, they have to have enough growth on them that like it's even physically possible to collar them up. Um, and they have to have enough like green sticking out the top to like sustain the plant. Um, so they, I'd see at least a foot. Can they be blanched using soil as, as opposed they, to say the cereal box? <laughs> yeah, yes, they can. I've seen it done. Um, the one thing I'll say about that is if you have issues with beetles or mealybug, uh, pill bugs, sow bugs, um, uh, like they're already chewing on things like your turnips or your beets, um, and then you bury your celery underground, um, you may end up with some chewed stalks. Um, also, like that makes it even easier for slugs to get at them. Uh, so anything you bury underground, you know, you've just kind of like, you've just moved the food stuff into where all of like our, you know, decomposer class of insects and pests uh live so you you know they've got easier access so you got to kind of like watch that a little bit um but you know like cardboard if it gets wet it starts to get floppy so like that's something you might have to you know swap out every once in a while or like keep refreshed maybe once or twice um so I say experiment with it and then let me know how it goes because that would be something that we would absolutely add to a presentation like this. Um, but yes, you can use you know cardboard, cardboard boxes, burlap, um, and yes, you can also bury them in soil. Okay, peas. I'm gonna rock and roll on these guys. Um, Snap peas are grown for their edible pods. Um, shelling peas are only harvested for their peas. Um, so yeah, one has a long harvest, one has a single harvest. 
So they're grown for a different, you're looking for different things. Um, on the one side with snap peas, you're looking for them to be, and I'll show you a picture, in this sweet spot where they're not too young and they're not too old. They're like right in between because that's like the ideal texture and flavor for fresh eating of snap peas. Shelling peas, on the other hand, they you're going to let them go way past the point um, um, to the point where like shelling peas are like big and plump and, um, you know, they've gone quite a bit older. So you've got two different ages um, that um, so, you know, in terms of maturity, one is harvested a little bit more immature than the other. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that. Um, uh, when harvested well um, and kept cold, um, I agree with this, one to two weeks refrigerated um, and shelled peas, definitely better suited than snap peas for canning and freezing, for sure. Radishes, um, yeah, radishes are another crop where they're perfect one day and then they either split or like their bottoms split open or they bolt and then you get like a really tough radish out of it um, depending on your weather. So radishes are something that you should just sow every two weeks in little amounts to get a continuous harvest off of. Um, it's definitely a succession planting crop for sure. Um, and you want to make sure that as soon as they're like a good size, you know, somewhere around, depending on the variety, you know, quarter to golf ball size, um, uh, you're getting them out and getting them into storage or selling them. Um, because the longer they sit there, even if they haven't split or bolted, you'll end up with um, this pithiness that we call in the middle. If you were to cut the radish open, um, there'd be like these air pockets and their flavor would not be very great. Um, that pithiness uh, is not super marketable and it's something that we look for, um, for sure. So if anything, harvest them early when they're small instead of when they're like huge or blown out. And if you take the greens off of them, uh, they will last even longer in your crisper drawer or a cooler environment. So if you want long-term storage out of your radishes, um, take the greens off of them. And the same goes for carrots and beets and uh, turnips. They all store longer without their greens on them. Oops. So here's a picture of peas in three stages. So too small, these guys haven't been filled, haven't filled out yet. Give them like another day or two until they reach perfect, which is, you know, kind of they're starting to get a little fatter around the middle, um, but you can't really see the individual peas, you know, the little like bulges yet. And then too big, you can definitely see like the ind individual uh, peas forming um, then you're going to get some like stringiness in the pod, a little bit of discoloration. Um, and those are what we call too far gone, uh, for market. Or now, but you can, can you distinguish between these are for snap peas, right? Not shelling peas. Which is yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, the, yeah, I should have said those are, uh, sugar snap peas. Um, the picture is sugar snap peas. Um, for shelling peas, you want to harvest them when they're basically in this too big phase. So pretend like this is a shelling pea. It's not, but pretend that too big phase or farther down, you know, more mature than that. So like you can see a well-defined pea in there. Um, so yeah, good. Thank, good question. Yeah, that definitely make the distinction there. And then is that snow peas to the upper right? Yep, it is. It is. And these, in my opinion, are a little farther. I'd say those are kind of like a little more mature than when I would normally harvest them. Uh, I like to harvest snow peas when you can tell that um, 
there's a, there are peas in there, but those are really, really well defined. I'd say they're a little bit older than I like for market. Um, you don't want them when they're totally flat, but and you can't tell that there are peas in there, but those look a little bit old in my opinion. I don't know. Keto, what do you think? Are those too old? Uh, I, I, I feel you on that one. Sure. Yeah. And radishes we've already covered, but um, you want to make sure that they don't have that flower stalk coming out of the middle of them. Those are just for compost at that point. Um, you want to harvest them, if anything, earlier, smaller than you would, marble size. Um, and then anything that's split like this uh, is not marketable um, through us. Um, and again, as we're talking about pathogens and bacteria, that's a great entryway for bacteria to get into that food. So no splits or cracking. This is a ton of information. So I'm not gonna read or go through all of this um, because you're gonna get a copy of this. Um, but with carrots um, and beets, uh, since most of the plant is, or most of the edible part is underground, the question I get most often is how do I know it's ready? Um, and what you can do is you can kind of like use your finger to move some of the soil, not deep, but like some of the soil around or off where the top where the greens go into the soil, just like a little bit. Um, and then you'll be able to see kind of like the shoulder or like the top of that carrot. And if the diameter is you'll be able to get a good idea of the diameter on the carrot. Um, and depending on the variety, you're looking for something around like a quarter size looking down and then pull that carrot. Um, again, that's, it depends on the variety or the, yeah, the variety that's planted. Um, and then if you want to, you can like put the soil back if it's not ready, but like it sucks when you go to pull carrots because you think, you know, the greens look beautiful, therefore the carrot must be big. And then you pull it up and it looks like this, like little baby carrotness with, you know, like some greens on the top. Um, that's a bummer. So like you can kind of like fudge it and kind of like pull some of the soil back, like, you know, check it out, see if it's ready. Um, you know, don't do that too often. Otherwise the carrot is not going to like it, but if you're close to harvest, that's a good way of judging. These carrots that are super small got that way because they were not adequately spaced. And this is a big thing with uh, planting carrots in general. Um, carrots need to be spaced in order to make really big roots at about like, you know, a minimum of two in two inches in between each carrot sometimes even three inches, depending on the variety. So you can see from this photo that these carrots are all spaced out really well. And you can see from the photo on the bottom right that when they're spaced really well like that, you get a nice fat carrot out of it. Um, carrots don't like competition. They can kind of almost sense when they're, well, they know when they're too close to something else. Um, and when you pack them in too tightly, you'll get really beautiful greens, and then you'll get these like little shrimpy carrots on the bottom. So make sure that you're going and thinning your carrots um, once they're, you know, one to two inches tall um, uh, uh, to get, you know, maximum carrot out of that plant. And let's see. Beets, same deal. If your ultimate beet size is somewhere around two to three inches, if you sew them really tight together, you know, like really tight, same deal. You'll get little shrimpy beets and lots of greens. So you want to make sure that you're spacing your carrots or going back and thinning your carrots to, you know, two to three inches in between them to get a nice big beet out of it at the end. Um, and again, with both of those, if you remove the greens from them prior to storage, um, one, you can eat the greens, they're delicious, both carrot and beet greens, and two, they're gonna store much longer for you in that state. Oh, and there is a note here about not washing them prior to long-term storage. That is true. Um, although I've seen both 
cases. But some folks, if you have a root cellar, the old fashioned way is to pull your carrots out, gently dust off any dirt, um, cut the tops off and put them in the root cellar. And there you go. Um, old school. Um, you can do that um, if you have really good control in your root cellar. But for most of us, it's washing, topping, and then storage. Potatoes are a whole thing. <laughs> um, potatoes benefit from periodic hilling, just like uh, just like leeks. The more you hill a potato, the more potatoes you get. Potatoes grow off the main stem or the stalk of the plant. Um, so the more, and they grow under the ground. Um, so the more stalk is covered by ground, the more potatoes you have. Um, so I think we did like once a month or maybe twice a month hilling um, at KGD Farm in the past. Um, and that's how you get the maximum potato off of your potato plants. You can also start them in a ditch. So instead of starting at the soil level, dig deep and plant them basically at the bottom of a trench. And then, then you've got even more like, you know, vertical like space to work with. So then you bury them in the trench once the plant grows up and then you can hill and that'll give you a little more like vertical space to work with. Um, when the plant, the potatoes are ready, generally when the plant dies back, um, or keto correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but when you start to see like seed pods on the plant itself. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that the seed pods are okay, but I don't, I'm not sure. Gotcha. But usually, but I mean, most of the time I experience that they just die back. Yeah, that's that's my take on it too. And not just like crispy leaves, but when the plant itself dies back. So that's what I'm going with. Um, I will say, because this happened at KGD Farm, uh, once the plant dies back, like getting the potatoes out of the ground should be number one priority. Once the plant dies, those potatoes are, uh, no longer under its protection. And if you get really wet weather, as we tend to do towards like the end of the season when, they, when they're when they ready, they will rot in the ground. And this happened. We had a almost complete potato loss due to just them sitting in the ground for too long when it was really, really wet. So once the plant is ready, get them out of the ground, get them stored. Spinach and baby leaf salad mix. Um, and we've got, so we've got, yeah, okay. Spinach and baby leaf salad mix. Um, this is something, this is also like a succession planting kind of thing. Um, it's kind of, yeah, once the plant gets large enough, you can start harvesting off of it. Um, all of the things on this on this uh, uh, page are um, cold season loving crops. So your lettuce and your spinach will bolt if um, it gets too hot out. Um, so that's usually the end um, of it. Also, spinach will start getting this kind of like powdery stuff. It's oxalic acid on its like young leaves when it gets too old. Um, which will upset your stomach and totally change the flavor and texture of the spinach. Um, so like old spinach isn't that great anyways. Um, you always want to harvest the oldest leaves off first for continuous harvest. Um, so you can do that by either like pinching it off or cutting it off. Um, you can harvest an entire spinach plant at a time, but if you just have a small patch of spinach, you might as well be selective about it and get more spinach off of it over a longer period of time. Um, and with head lettuce, again, one-off crop, um, but a very quick crop. Um, just like bok choy, there's a sweet spot where like it's perfect. 
one moment and then if it gets too much heat it will bolt um, and then your lettuce becomes very bitter um, and the texture changes um, so you want to harvest these things younger um, and also with all leafy greens including kale and collards and bok choy uh, you want to harvest when the day when outside of like the hottest part of the day. So either really early morning, which is ideal, um, or like if you have to later in the day, but I'll say a lot of the bitterness you get with midday harvesting, you'll also get with late day harvesting. Um, so early morning, like before, you know, the sun comes up or as early as possible. Um, one, it's gonna help keep everything cool, but two, the plants taste better in the morning. And here's a picture of some bolted spinach for you. Uh, spinach that has flowers on it, uh, not as marketable, um, maybe sold as seconds. Uh, it's good for sauteing or baking with, like putting in quiche or something like that. But for fresh eating, it's not very good. Um, so you wanna, for continuous spinach harvest, you wanna just like harvest it young and then plant more spinach every two weeks during the cold season to have more of it coming um, after harvest. And here's a great picture of a bolted head of lettuce. Um, you're welcome to eat it, but this is not marketable. Ideally, it looks like this with a nice tight head um, and none of this kind of like Christmas tree action in the middle of it. Um, and harvested early um, when the plant is still cool and is tastiest. How are we doing on time, Keto? Do we need like a question break or anything? Um, well, we're at 7.40. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's do a little check-in. How, how's everybody doing? Um, you know, we're just kind of plugging through on tips and techniques for the plethora of vegetables that we can grow. But I would put out there, if you haven't seen something that you're particularly interested in learning about, um, or if you have questions specific to a, a particular crop, um, then go please go ahead and, and drop that in the chat. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, we'll just keep going and uh, yeah. we'll open up to some more questions at the end. And, and uh, we'll maybe try and get to about five of and then have you know just maybe we can hear a few voices it's nice to hear just not our voices sometimes <laughs> so <laughs> i agree <laughs> I don't care sometimes to be in a zoom and feel like you're talking to the void absolutely i've got the void here and i've got like a steady stream of like strange like eastern market people through this office <laughs> so it's a weird it's weird over here right now um yeah and also i mean i will talk ad nauseum about all of these things but i mean this is a great opportunity for you guys to like if there's something that you know you're going to specialize in or something that like you don't like you're struggling with uh or something even better that you want to bring to market but you're not sure like how it should look at market or like what we're looking for um please oh please this is a great opportunity um to to like we can all you know talk about how best to do that um so i'm gonna keep going until someone says otherwise um green beans we're kind of like in the same realm as the peas and the shelling peas, but um, just like those guys, you got to get out there every day when they're when they're on um, to uh, make sure you're staying on top of harvest. Um, and you can store those in the refrigerator um, until you have like enough to bring to market. That's kind of the beauty of it, uh, of really good storage. Um, if you have a really good storage, yeah, you can extend the amount of time before har before sale where you're holding produce. Um, so you can ultimately bring more produce to market, which is pretty cool. Um, with green beans, some of this is uh, depends on what you're going to use them for. But in general, I prefer and customers at market prefer that they be on the younger, more tender side than like older and maybe stringier, but bigger side. Uh, not like super immature where they're like, they look basically like fat toothpicks. 
but you want them in this like sweet spot where there's still like a tube, like a very like nice green tube and you can't tell, you can just start to tell that there are beans in there. So they have this like slight waviness, but mostly they're like fairly straight. Um, otherwise the, the pods or the beans themselves get tough. Um, and that's not fun. Then you have to, you can't eat them fresh. Uh, you have to cook them in order to kind of like take away some of that, uh, toughness, uh, summer squash. I feel like we all know what a too far gone zucchini looks like, um, you can always make zucchini bread, but there's always a point where you've made too much zucchini bread and your neighbors have made too much zucchini bread. And now it's like going to compost. So make sure that you're harvesting often um, when they're on the more immature side. So like smaller guys, um, maybe the flower end, you know, they're always attached to like that blossom has like just fallen off and they're in the more like six to eight inch realm instead of that 10 to 12 to two feet long realm. People really love those at market. Um, they're really tender, they're good for grilling, they have great flavor. Um, so pick them early. Hey Molly. Yeah. A few questions. Um, Perfect. Asparagus, can you share some advice on how to start and care for those, especially because it takes time? Absolutely. Um, yeah, asparagus is a, what is it? Three to five year perennial in order for them to get going. Did I get that in, that window right? It takes a while, it takes three, years. Two to three, I would say. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so an asparagus crown. So jokingly, I'll say when, like, when was the best time to establish asparagus? It was five years ago, like always five years ago, right? It takes years for the crown to get big enough to the point where you can harvest a certain percentage of those spears and not impact the plant by taking too much off of it. In the same way, you can over harvest kale, you can over harvest collards, you can over harvest spinach and that, or bleh, asparagus, and that's why it's, we say it takes years. Um, so like in year one, you just let it do its thing. Like you just tend to it, keep it weeded and let it go. Um, year two, you know, maybe you let it go, but you might get a couple spears off of it. Um, I tell people you don't wanna harvest more than half of the spears that are coming off of it. Keto, chime in here if you feel like it should be more conservative than that. Um, by year three, four, and definitely five, you've probably gone from three, you know, st stock spears in year two to like six to eight to like 10 to 12. And then you're in like production mode with it. Um, so that's why it takes so long. Um, asparagus. The, the part you're eating, if you don't catch it, turns into this like really beautiful, tall and very woody, like fern-like, you know, leafiness. Um, and it does that very quickly. Um, it goes from like edible to not edible within a day or two. Um, so that's one of these, just like peas and just like, you know, sometimes radishes when it's hot out. Um, you got to go out and check them pretty much every day when you see the first one come up. Okay. And then one other question. Um, it's a pest question. So, uh, or maybe, well, I'm having an issue with my tomatillos and it's spreading to my peppers. I'm not sure if it's flea beetles or cucumber beetles, but I'm having yellowing leaves and jagged leaves. Is it because I've planted Ooh. all my sweet and hot peppers and tomatillos in the same raised bed? Uh, could be. It could be. I wonder if you, it could be cucumber beetle. It could be slugs also. Um, uh, depends on what the jagged edges look like and the yellowing leaves. Um, I think I'd need to see more like photos of the damage, but they're plagued by a lot of the same things. Um, 
tell you what, Dietra, I'll, I think you have my email, but I'm going to put my email in the chat. And yeah. uh, if you could send some pics, uh, then we can try and get a diagnosis on that. Okay. I'm Any sorry, though. That's tough. Yeah, that's tough. super tough. Okay, I'd say keep going. Cool, bean pictures. So I've got here like, you know, the ideal for market anyways, um, uh, is like, you know, fairly thin. You can just start to see that the beans are starting to form in there. Um, and in the middle picture, we've got kind of like all the different stages, right? So if you're growing them, so the green ones are like marketable, those yellowing ones are getting old. I would not bring those to market. Um, and then the dark ones have been left on the pod to the point where this person is actually gonna save those seeds um, and either keep them as dry beans or use them as like next year's, like I'm gonna plant these, which is pretty cool. And summer squash. Uh, this gigantic one is slated for zucchini bread, absolutely. And then these little guys are a little bit of a, um, especially when they still have the blossom attached to them. I know chefs love this kind of stuff. Um, that's very fancy. And suddenly your zucchini is worth way more in the eyes of a chef um, when they're these like little super tender little baby zucchinis. That's kind of a specialty product for some people. Um, also the blossoms off of zucchinis and summer squash can be sold too. Um, for something like a quarter, a quarter a blossom is what we sell them at at market. Um, they're a real specialty item, which is great. Um, and then these zucchinis up on the upper uh, right are also kind of perfect. Um, they're in more of that like eight to eight to 10 inch kind of space, but they're still really shiny and they look kind of new. When they get that dull look to them, they're usually too far gone. Winter squash is a whole situation. Um, if I had to like dial it back to a couple key points, it's basically um, with winter squash, you're gonna let them grow until the plant is basically totally dead. Um, just keep them watered, keep them weeded, keep them happy uh, when the plant dies back um, and uh, the vine starts to die back. Um, this can happen in, you know, October ish. Um, you can even actually, you can leave them out in the field after like a couple light frosts. Um, although watch for that. Some are more susceptible to frost than others. Um, uh, wait for it to die back, wait for the stalk or the, the stem and st the, the connection between the um, winter squash and the vine to start to die too and, and uh, dry. Um, and then you want to cut them off and give them a, um, at least a one week cure. Um, yeah. You can either cure by cutting the winter squash and then leaving them out in the field. So disconnect them from the vine and leave them out in the sun to cure, or you can do it in a more controlled environment. You cut them, you bring them into a spot for curing. Um, you can do this in the sun, uh, but you want uh, relatively high temperatures um, and really good ventilation, good wind flow. Um, uh, in order to cure those for long-term storage. Um, and after that, um, follow those storage instructions and then you know you can have them for several months if you store them well. Um, once they're cured, if they get too cold after a cure, um, it will reduce their, uh, their storage life for sure. And then okra, honestly, of all of these things, I have the least experience with. Um, so I'm just going to take these notes uh, straight and say definitely harvest them small. Like the bigger the pod, you want them to be like two to three inches. Uh, the bigger that pod gets, the more woody it gets and the less flavorful um, and store them in the refrigerator. And beyond that, I'm actually 
open to anyone else's storage uh, suggestions because that one is not very familiar to me. Okay, Molly, we're getting um, getting close to time. Um, okay. So I would say if we could, I mean, so many. <laughs> so I just want to reiterate to everybody that we are going to share all these slides so you can reference this stuff later. Um, and there was a few questions. Um, so uh, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, first, I want to say, I, Dietra, I did look a little bit. Um, you know, the images are going to really help us narrow in on what's going to ha what's happening with your tomatillos. But if you, um, it could be overwatering or potentially a nitrogen deficiency with yellowing. But if there's holes, then that's more of a pest thing. So um, those images are going to help us figure that out. And then um, John Samuels is saying, in all my years, I planted broccoli. Uh, the plants grow great. But um, but I come out to my garden and and one is flop, one is flopped over, and all the plants around them are fine. Why did that happen? Oh no! Uh, one big broccoli plant, and it's over. Um, so uh, it could be cutworm. Uh, uh, something in the soil, uh, maybe very industrious. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of like, sometimes like soil beetles will, will mess with the roots enough that it's a problem. Sometimes you get, you know, trying to think of who eats it, um, other than like rabbits, which has been an issue for me, could be cutworm I, with a picture of the damage I'd have to see, but if everybody else is okay, my, my vote is pest, um, because it kind of takes water, light, soil, uh, planting time out of the equation if everybody else is doing well. Um, or sometimes, sometimes if it's a really heavy plant, I'll say like wind, like when sometimes it sucks, but like sometimes the weather, like one plant may have had like a really weird bend in its stem that like you couldn't see. And if if it gets pinched or snaps off, sometimes it's just nature. Sometimes it's just the the elements uh, working against you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any tips on storing ground cherries? Do I remove the husks? Um. You don't remove the husks. Do I have that readily available? I would have to double check on that. Um, because if you put them in a really humid environment, uh, the husks kind of like take on that moisture. Um, and then they get kind of like floppy and they start to mold. Um, so for, for to tomatoes, right? What's that? Similar to tomatoes, right? Yeah, I think it's a it's like a higher temp, but like a like a medium medium humidity. It's yeah, it's like 55, 60 degrees and like medium humidity. I I could double check, but yeah, um for long term storage, long long term storage, uh, I believe you take the husks off, and then for even longer storage, like food dehydrator. <laughs> Cause then you're in the, what's called the, you're making golden berries, which is one of these like superfood things you, you see in like health food stores. They're marketed as this thing called golden berries. Um, I believe. They're good, I've tasted them. Hot tip. Um, <clears throat> okay, John, I, so you, you're, you're saying here, um, all broccoli flops, no holes. What do you mean by that? Uh, no insect, no signs of insect problem. Okay. Uh, I checked that, but the leaves just flop down. I just, oh, just the leaves. The, it's not the whole plant, just the leaves the fell. Leaves just flop down. Okay. And everything around it, I, I water it and. Uh, just and one plant? Huh? Just one plant? No, I, I, I put it in my raised garden. Um, 
I had it in the regular soil years gone by, but the last couple of years I've been putting it in the raised garden and I had the same effect in the ground and in the raised garden. But I'm saying that's it, the, the, the flopping leaves is just happening to one plant or more, more than one plant? All, all the broccoli flopped. Ah. Oh. Everything else was okay. Hmm. Huh. I That's got it in this now. I've got it in the same raised garden where I've got my uh, garlic. Um, I put the, my lettuces in there, and when I dug them up, I had some kale, some um, dinosaur kale and curly kale. I just put that where the broccoli was. Yeah. Hmm. My first thing is you know watering, watering, but like you know how you know to not under or over water and then uh might be over watered but no no other plants seem to be bothered by it yeah that's interesting i'm not sure i'm not totally sure with the wilty leaves okay thank you i'm sorry yeah i i i am not totally sure and like there was no like you when you pulled the plants out like the roots looked fine and everything looked fine uh, the roots had began taking and spreading out, and as I said, the plants was beginning to get some size. And uh, I don't know, I just came out and bingo. Mm. Interesting. And then when the big rain came the other day, everything stood up real fine. And then shortly after that, it, they flopped, just like they do every year. Huh. Maybe they just don't like me. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, that's hard, that's hard I, I guess that wasn't clear. You're saying this happens every year. Yeah, it, I have never had a, when I first started gardening, that was many years ago, over 10 years ago, the broccoli came up fairly well. But since then, I have never gotten any broccoli. Are you, are you moving it to different spots in the garden? I have, I had it in the original, I rotated in the original soil and then I came to the raised garden. Uh-huh, weird, okay. So I just give up on broccoli and go with the kale and in college. You get more harvest out of those anyways. Yeah, good point. No, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, I, if you if if you have any pictures that might help lead us down a path of figuring it out a little bit I wish more. Which I had thought about that before. I dug them up yesterday. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. Thanks anyway. Yeah. Sorry about that. Maybe we'll try again next year. Well, um, actually, well, fungus, but it's I'm like the only other, the only other common thing, if when you dug it up or in the garden, is it compost in there? Sorry. There is a little compost in there. Yes. Not a lot. So the only other common thing is one, it's been really, really hot. So like yeah. they will wilt in the heat Two, uh, if there was some sort of fungus, uh that was growing in there like you would see like white kind of like fuzzy like it's hard to describe but it would like like white kind of like powdery stuff in and through your soils near the roots that could be impacting all of them because that would also be common because they're all in the same kind of like kind of like engineered space right uh -huh. um so that might be it Okay, well, as I said, I'll try it again maybe next okay. year or in the fall or something. We'll see. Gotcha. Okay, guys. Well, um, there's, you know, there's more information that will be in the slides. Um, we missed a few of the stuff, the, uh, the resource sheets and such, but um, the links and everything will be when I share out. I'm going to email all this stuff to you guys as well as the recording from tonight. Um, so you can listen to it again if you'd like. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for coming out. Good to see everybody. Um, and uh, and hopefully you got some good information that was helpful. And we will see you at the next one. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night and thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. I'll be sending pictures, Keto. Okay, cool. <laughs>